and we're good. We are here today to give some insight into what it means to be a Python Software Foundation Board Director. So quick intros, I am the Executive Director of the PSF and with me I have two Board Directors, Lorena Mesa and Marlene Mangami. Thank you both for taking the time to join me today. Um, so, yeah. so diving into what the PSF does is, is a bit out of scope for, for what we're trying to chat about today. So I included a link to um, the general page for the Python Software Foundation here at the bottom. Um, so www.python.org slash PSF and you could learn more about the PSF there. So let's jump in. Why are we here today? So we're here because the PSF board elections are coming up. Um, at this point in time, we are accepting nominations and we'll be accepting nominations through May 31st, and that is AOE, Anywhere on Earth. Um, and voter application cutoff date is also May 31st. And the votings will start June 8th and will go through June 17th. So we wanna take the time today to give everyone a, a, a bit of insight as to what directors do from the point of view of these two um, directors. And we also listed some responsibilities that we might not cover on a general wiki page. And that's the link here, it's bit.ly slash PSF dash board. Uh, that should give a, a good overview of at least the responsibilities of a PSF board member. So we have some questions that we're going to ask everyone. Um, there might be a bit of delay since we're doing this live. Um, we appreciate everyone's patience as we go through. Uh, so let's go ahead and start. Uh, how about Lorena with you? How did you find out about the PSF board elections? Thanks, Eva. That's a great question because I feel like that's one I get a lot. <laughs> um, so let's see. It must have been well. I, okay, so. In Chicago, where I'm, um, where I'm based, and actually some other really awesome Pythonistas, like like you are based, um, Naomi Cedar, who's the current chair of the board, well, the outgoing chair, I should say, of the board, um, is based in Chicago. Uh, but broadly speaking, the Chicago Python User Group, which I always encourage people, if you're looking for places to get information, look to see if there's a local um, user group in your area that meets. And that's actually really the first place that I first started getting involved with Python. Then when I started becoming a community organizer, like that was yet again a place I started kind of getting support. And then when um, after starting with PyLady Chicago and I started thinking about, you know, I love the hyper local work that I'm doing. How can I do a bit more in the kind of, be it the national or the inter or international kind of space? What can I do? And it was actually through Chicago Python user group that I had first heard about this board when Chippy, as we affectionately call them, announced that there was board meeting, uh, that there was a board uh, election that was opening up. And I was like, excuse me, question, what is that? So I, I, through my local user group. How about you, Marlene? Um, I actually found out about the board from Le Lorena. <laughs> um, she, <laughs> yes, so she was, I was running an organization uh, in Zimbabwe and uh, Lorena had actually volunteered to do um, we were doing sort of a mentorship program for girls that were interested in Python and um, I had reached out uh, to the Pi Ladies group I think I'm not sure exactly who I <laughs> emailed and Lorena responded and uh, she had agreed to do sort of an interview and give advice to some of the girls that were um, learning Python. And then after that, we were just having a conversation on, on Twitter. And I think the elections were coming up or something like that. And, uh, and she was talking about it. And um, she just suddenly just suggested that I try to, <laughs> to run for the board. And, you know, I was definitely very apprehensive about it. But then she, she definitely, she is very convincing and convinced me to do it. How I've heard about it. And we're happy that you're here. Absolutely. And that, yeah. actually, that brings up a good point because you touched a little bit on, on recruitment, right? Which is, is what Lorena sort of did. She kind of helped with the outreach of the PSF and, and, re and helped recruit new board directors, which is also a responsibility of, of a board director. Um, so moving on, why did you want to volunteer for the PSF board? Marlene, let's start with you. 
Um, well, for me, I think the more I learned about the PSF and even right now, I think um, just knowing about how much the PSF supports um, Python communities around the world is a really big driving factor for me um, to, to want to actually be part of the PSF. So um, I, I'm very passionate about community because I think community um, provides a space for communal learning. And I think not everyone has access to sort of paid programs like a CS degree where you can do stuff like ask a professor um, questions when you have questions and um, or your fellow students and so I think for people who are self-learning and for me when I was initially starting with Python a lot of what I was doing was self-learning <clears throat> and the local community here in Zimbabwe, whether that was like the Django girls user group or the um, uh, Python Zimbabwe community, all of those were supported by the PSF. And um, through those communities, I was actually able to ask questions and um, actually feel more confident about learning Python by myself. And so for me, I think because the PSF is supporting my community and communities around the world. It's a really um, sort of, you know, a really great uh, community to be a part of. And, and that's why I volunteer. Well, one of the reasons why. <laughs> That's awesome. I love how the central point of all of our answers have been so far going back to our local communities, which is really awesome. Lorena, how about you? Yeah. So no shock. I was really passionate about explicit causes that were born from my, from my experience working in Chicago, both from the vantage point of being very passionate about diversity and inclusion. Since one of the things I think a lot of people, when they ask about what the Python Software Foundation does, and Eva, thank you for pointing to the landing page in that first slide for the Python Software Foundation. Um, the Python Software Foundation, while we do get to interact with core Python, like that development community, we are not the core developers. Um, what we're thinking about is like the longevity of the Python open source community, being um, helping make sure that there's funds available to make sure the infrastructure of Python continues to be supported, be it growing the global, uh, the global community to reflect the rich, the rich diversity and inclusion that we see when we go to in-person events, when we, when we meet fellow Pythonistas, um, all of those kind of things for me were, are very passionate because the, you know, to, I think all of us have quoted probably at some time or another, Brett Cannon, I came for the language, I stayed for the community. Um, so knowing that this was a space that really I had flourished in a lot and really have made so many meaningful connections with. There were explicit things, particularly particularly related around diversity and inclusion that I wanted to continue to work on. And as a board director member, we're, we're, we're actually able to interface with the uh, with the staff, particularly through uh, folks like you, you, Eva, talking about kind of you know um, what what kind of initiative should the PSF be thinking about? Us as kind of the public face, we get to go out and meet the community, talk with people about how they're using Python, what challenges do they have, what what things would they like to see in our roadmap, and then we can kind of bring that back to. Uh, back back to you all back to the staff to help you all think about like what are some what are some initiatives that ought that the staff ought to be thinking about what are some roadblocks what are ways that we can start helping build strategic kind of relationships so as a director um, you know it there's obviously the core language that we use and that we write but then there's all the other support that goes along with it and I think that for many of us you know you may you, well, we, well, many of us here have that kind of background of being a community organizer. There's all kinds of reasons why folks may come to the board. You might be someone who has a really cool project. Um, for example, fellow director Eric Holscher from Write and Read the Docs has really grown this really great movement around, you know, thinking about open source in a different way and like documentation. And obviously there's a lot to be said about that and its role in Python. So for me, the volunteer, um, volunteering just meant that it, I, I was kind of continuing on, on the legacy of some of the things that I had worked on, um, but also the other thing too that I really wanted to think a little bit more about was Python in education and Python in scientific, in scientific kind of projects. And what better place to be than on the board working alongside a board of other passionate people that have diverse and eclectic interests so that we can kind of measure the, the have a have a reflective measurement of what we ought to work on and how because while I might have one thing that I'm really passionate about you know 
we all as a group kind of have to come together to think about like what's the appropriate steps to we take as we move forward um, for the foundation. Yeah, that's a great, a great point. All those points that you made are awesome. So Marlene, you mentioned earlier that you were a bit apprehensive when Lorena approached you to join the board. What, what kind of advice would you give to someone that is, is having similar, similar feelings? Um, I would definitely advise anyone that's thinking about joining the board or nominating themselves to go ahead and nominate yourself and um, just, you know, just try it out. I think for me, one of the reasons that I was very nervous was, you know, on the one hand, I felt like I didn't have enough experience. And then also something else was that I've you know, I'm based in Africa, <laughs> which is like, and sometimes I think a lot of uh, sort of technology communities and sort of technology um, centers sort of feel like they're, it's very US centric and everything is happening in the US. And so for myself, when, at first, I was also kind of nervous because of uh, the fact that I wasn't based in the US and I was based, um, you know, in Zimbabwe. And it's been very cool to actually see how diverse the, the current board is and how many, you know, even how many time zones we have to coordinate yes. with on the board to do a meeting. Um, we have people from Australia and people from, you know, different, just different places and different time zones, even in the US, just very surprised as well by US time zones. <laughs> um, but uh, that's been really nice to see. Um, and yeah, just don't vote yourself out before, um, before you, you give it a try. So I would definitely encourage people to, to, to try. Great words of inspiration, absolutely. Lorena, how about you? Uh, I mean, I did actually do a little bit of a listening tour with folks that were on the board uh, or had previously served on the board when I initially started thinking about this back in, I think it was 2016. Um, and yeah, I, I think imposter syndrome is super real. No, I, I truly believe that, but I will also say if you're feeling that imposter syndrome, there's probably, that probably means that you don't see yourself in the board, which means you ought to be there. <laughs> but taking that, you know, in all seriousness, uh, it is, it is, it is a little, it, it is jarring to put yourself out there, particularly thinking about, you know, um, like, have I done enough or like, what's that look like? And I think because the nature of the board is so open, that can add a little bit of apprehension about nominating yourself. But at the end of the day, there's no number of years of expertise in Python that's required. There's no like bizarre certificate you have to get. Um, at the end of the day, you just need to be passionate about wanting to bring something to the Python community. And, you know, that's, that's really what this position's for. It's obviously volunteer based. But if you've got ideas, I always kind of describe the, the board as like choose your own level of commitment. <laughs> so, so, you know, you, if you do have other commitments, um, think about that, but also really do spend that time thinking about like what's important to you. It, if you, um, another thing about, um, you know, nominating is that there might actually be someone who also you think is really great that you can start a conversation with. So all that to say, if you are considering it, like what do you have to lose? It, it's a great opportunity. And it's something that I think is a great way to, to demonstrate that you are passionate about things. And it's, it's a great way to start conversations too, because when you start thinking about like why you want to be in this space, you know, there's a, there's a lot of different directors that can speak to kind of different vantage points of like things they've done or things that we need to, we need to prioritize. But really, I think we all have some level of intimidation when we first start this journey, but we're all human at the end of the day. So I think it's fair to say trying something out, and, you know, if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. No, no, no big loss because you can always try again in the future if that's something that you would like to do. Yeah, trying again is an important point to remember. I think uh, highlighting the discussions and conversations portion is also important because all of our directors right now are open to answering questions and having more in-depth conversations with anyone that might be interested. And that can be either through our Twitter or even in direct emails, which we'll get to at the end. Okay, so, and Lorena, you touched a little bit on this requirements for being a board director. Uh, some of the things you mentioned is, is no level of experience is needed. Uh, do you wanna add more to that? 
Sure. Uh, so I, on the requirements for being a director, you don't necessarily have to come in like with that. Uh, you know, I think people think of like politics or they're like, I need to have like a campaign slogan of like five issues. No, not not at all. Um, as you register uh, yourself or be it you self-nominate or you have a dialogue with someone and you receive their consent to nominate someone else, basically putting yourself forward as a director, people do want to know who you are. So I think the only requirement in thinking about that is just, you know, like why, like knowing how to answer the question about why you're passionate. Why do you feel that you could bring something to the, uh, to being on the board of directors. Again, there's no formula related to that. Um, if you have questions about that, I, I think again, as you mentioned, any of us directors would be happy to chat more about that. I know we're gonna be doing, like we did in the past, that 24 hour, the kind of AMA, ask me anything in a few different spaces. Um, but aside from that, the requirements for being a director, you don't need, there's not any number of years of expertise. There's, there's not like you have to have like committed this many lines of code, actually, I don't need, I don't believe you need to be more than, do you just need to be like a basic direct, uh, basic member of the Python Software Foundation? Okay. Nope. Yeah, I was like, I don't Marlene, do, do you want to add to that? Um, sure, I, I mean, everything that Lorena said was right on, um, on point. Um, yeah, there's, you don't have to be a member uh, of the VSF actually at all. <laughs> um, you could literally just run and, you know, maybe just have an idea that there's an addiction. I think that that's like a basic thing that you have to do. Um, and you obviously need to be nominated, but you don't even have to be nominated by someone else. You can nominate yourself. Um, so it is very open sort of, um, yeah, it's very open. The evictions are. Yeah. It's, as we point out, there are really no requirements, but we would love to have everyone watching and listening to be a member regardless. <laughs> exactly. Um, going on to the next one. How was the onboarding experience to you, uh, for you? Uh, Marlene, do you want to talk about that a little bit? Um, sure. I think it was a very smooth onboarding experience. It wasn't um, as I, I thought it was going to be quite a lot, but it, it wasn't as um, difficult or <laughs> time consuming as I thought. Um, we have a, a call that you, uh, you have once you have made it onto the board and um, with Eva and I think the chair, I think Naomi was part of that as well, um, where you can ask questions and you're sort of updated with what your day-to-day -day will look like and meetings and things of that nature. Um, the call isn't very long. I don't think it's more than an hour. And um, there are, you also have um, some documentation that you will be sent. Uh, that you can look through to sort of, you know, if you have any other questions as well, to uh, to read through the documentation um, to see what you'll need to know. Um, and also, you know, uh, for me, when I was starting out as well, just being able to ask questions to fellow board members. And uh, Naomi was really helpful as well, um, being available to answer any questions uh, when, you, when you are just joining. So I think that was pretty much my, my onboarding experience, yeah. Lorena, how about you? Yeah, actually things have, have grown quite a lot since I joined the board, um, but all that to say that this is an iterative process. So uh, knowing that there's this dialogue with the chair, I think is really fantastic. Also, again, the, the conversation between board members is very, uh, we have mechanisms to do that, be it through email or be it through setting up a one-on-one. -on -one. But the onboarding experience, that's really meant to be a place to ask, ask open questions. And obviously it's not like you have this window of time to ask questions. We're all uh, ramping up to some extent. So while there is a little bit of that more formalized, here's the chair, here's, here's, the, uh, here's awesome Eva who can ask, you can ask questions to. It's meant to be kind of a continual learning process where Sometimes we don't even know what we don't need until we don't until we realize we didn't have that. So onboarding is very much, I think, always an ongoing thing. Yeah, that's a great point. And to highlight, we we have open communication channels for everyday discussion whenever we need to. So we have a, a mailing list where we have uh, maybe more in depth conversations. We also have a Slack channel that we discuss things if we ever need to. 
Um, and of course, we have board meetings, which takes us to some of the next two topics that I think we can combine into one. Um, let's talk about some of the day-to-day -day tasks and, and board meetings. Um, Marlene, from your perspective, how are those handled? Um, so I think a lot of um, what Eva just said is a big part of that. So we have a Slack channel where there's pretty much continuous conversation um, throughout the day, but you can sort of choose uh, how often you would like to join and participate in the conversation on the Slack. There is also a mailing list um, that the board is, you know, receives emails from the community members. Um, and from time to, to time, there will be discussion on the mailing list. Um, in terms of you know your opinion sometimes is needed so sometimes you, you can just respond uh, on the mailing list but every, everything is sort of voluntary so you are not forced <laughs> um, to join in a conversation that you don't feel you would not like to be a part of or you don't feel like you have anything particular to add um, but most of the time it's uh, it's responding to emails or responding to conversation on the Slack and just sharing um, your thoughts on on what's being discussed and then our meetings I think our meetings are once every two months <laughs> I want to say yeah usually right now we're in a special circumstance so we do meet a bit more but yeah typically one every other week. Yeah. <laughs> right so i mean uh in a normal situation it would be once every two months but now we are having more frequent meetings when um when the need is there um, but those meetings are also not uh too time consuming it's about um i would say up to an hour um, <laughs> of discussion and uh, there's an agenda so it's uh, you know and I, I think um, Eva does a really great job in making sure we we keep the time <laughs> as well um, so yeah I think it's it's not um, I think you can really pace yourself and choose how much you would like to to be involved yeah that's a great point Lorena do you have any points to add I really love that theme of pacing yourself. Uh, I know when I first arrived, I was like, I want to do all the things. And <laughs> that's hard because there's a lot of different conversations, a lot of moving pieces. And I appreciate that, that really the board is such a supportive space where asking questions is encouraged. If we don't have the tool set, we're always kind of thinking about how can we help one another. And that being said is that our processes are continuously being iterated. So as an example, when you know the onboarding is one one good way of thinking about it when we have people come in who may not have been on boards before they're kind of thinking about how do i do this or um an, an example of other places that people might want to work for example the grants work we had previously kind of started doing kind of themed grants and we were we were noticing that like maybe we want to invest more in python and education which was an initiative that got kicked off in 2019 um those kind of conversations about wanting to do more happen as a result of what's on our radar, what we are talking about in our board meetings. And if, if people are passionate about a topic, they can raise their hand and say, hey, I want to help with that. So like the Python and education uh, grant kind of work um, was, uh, I believe, me, you, Eva, and then, uh, then, and then Naomi. Um, and that was more kind of like an iterative, uh, for us, because there was this discussion around Python and education, this was something that kind of organically happened. And then for a short period of time, we, we kind of start, we, we met maybe a handful of times, be it through a Slack conversation or through an email, um, where we were kind of working on the documents of like, what would that look like? What, what's our end goal? And, you know, maybe outside the bi-monthly meeting that added, perhaps, I don't know, let's say two or so hours a month of work. It's kind of um, the more you have passionate causes that you want to work on, it will add a little bit more time to your monthly commitment. Um, like I know Marlene uh, that you work with the uh, you do comms, so like working with our blog and like with our bloggers, like that's something additional, and that is something though is highly important because we want to make sure our community has visibility on things like that. So your day to day tasks are around what your interests are there is no mandate for you to do all the things and again it is all about pacing yourself so if you do find that there are things that don't exist that you would like to see be it a committee like working on like a python and education grants committee be it 
you want to get more involved with communications, be it, um, you know, we have some folks who are doing some really cool work, like there was the Moss grant that we received and one of our directors like Eric, um, like Eric Holscher, uh, worked on that uh, alongside some of our PSF staff. Um, we as, as directors are the, are kind of acting more in like an advisory role where we're having those, those public discussions, those private discussions, trying to figure out things that we can invest in. And we bring that back as in our, in our bi-monthly meetings to talk about what kind of initiatives should we take on. And then as needed, you know, we can help consult with staff. Uh, but again, that is why there is a PSF staff is to, you know, they actually bring that thing to the forefront and do the work. So we're kind of there in the capacity of helping do ideation, of helping bring, you know, that expertise where we might already have that connection or something like that. And depending on what you're taking on, it might be a few hours a month. Maybe you're just attending the bi-monthly meetings for a period of time, which is totally a-okay. So I think all, um, obviously this current moment is a little different. There's been a bit more as everyone has been responding to the new normal. So we've shifted a little bit there. So I think going into it and knowing that there should be a degree of flexibility for how we meet and what that looks like responding to, you know, be it out, outstanding circumstances or what, or what have you um, is something to also keep in mind as well. Yeah, all great points. Flexibility with your own time and, and just assessing your own time is, is all great. Um, I think you, you both highlight, highlighted the specialty involvement that some directors have. I mean, we have a lot of work groups where we invite directors to have oversight. Uh, we also have board committees where, where uh, folks get involved in, in more in-depth things like the finance committee. Um, so it, it all depends on what everyone's um, specialties and, and passions are. Uh, so we all sort of alluded to the special time that we're in now um, and, and how we're adapting to uh, handling COVID-19 situation and how the impact of it uh, and how it's impacting the PSF and, and the Python community. Um, Marlene, do you want to talk a little bit about how we've adapted um, during this time? Sure. Um, yes, like you mentioned, um, there's been an increase in frequency of our meetings. So we have, uh, you know, we meet a lot more regularly um, just because we are trying to navigate the situation and um, with PyCon having to go online. Um, I think especially leading up to the decision of uh, choosing to actually take PyCon online, um, there was a lot of conversation that was happening, you know, very regularly on a day-to-day -day basis. And I think that required quite a lot more engagement from directors um, at that time because a lot of decisions had to be made and had to be made very quickly. And so, um, I think that was a, a big thing that uh, we had to do to adapt. Also, I think communications has has really had to be a big thing there. Um, uh, we've had to, you know, sort of uh, contribute to uh, figuring out how to sort of communicate <laughs> certain things to the community. And um, I know even right now we are sort of putting out blog posts as well. Uh, I've been sort of, Lorena and I actually have been working with the blogging team to try and see how we can highlight some of the uh, community work that's being done to, you know, sort of assist with the COVID situation right now that's being done by the Py by Python community members. Um, and all of those things sort of have come out of this, this, this crisis, um, but I think we're, we're adapting quite well to it. Lorena, do you have anything to add? Uh, plus one, everything that you said, Marlene. <laughs> I, I mean, we're all learning, and I think the thing that I've been really thankful for is because it's a culture of learning on the board, you know, as we think about how to best support our community, all of us are crouched, crowdsourcing knowledge and resources, doing virtual events while we are already a group that is virtual because as as we said we have members in Australia, India, in Zimbabwe, across the continental United States. We've that tool set exists, but doing uh, but how do we like have meaningful grants for example during COVID? How do we provide meaningful programming while also making sure that we are ensuring the longevity of the Python Software Foundation 
relative to its mandate, which is again about making sure that the community continues to uh, to thrive and also the infrastructure that supports that community. So that has meant that there's a lot of us kind of digging in, thinking about strategy, making sure we are reaching out to community, have those those relevant conversations, and you know I think that maybe this is a great place to plug to say if there's things that anyone watching this has knowledge on that they want to share with us, that would be great too. So yeah, it, it's it's been just a little bit more uptake and in increase of frequency of communications, but that's already an organic thing with, with the with the group of directors. And we're, we're obviously thinking how that impacts our strategies relative to our other programming. Yeah, great points. I think we, we were all a bit stressed during those times, but I have to highlight that the board did an excellent job of coming together during a difficult time and making quick decisions and making decisions that uh, try to keep our community safe. So big applause to you both and to everyone else that's not on, on this video. So we've come to the end. Um, we, we didn't want to take too much time to record some of our thoughts, but we, we wanted to highlight ways that everyone can connect with the PSF going forward. So beyond us putting out blogs and tweets, we'll be doing a 24 hour Slack event, May 20th. Um, we'll send out the link to PSF vote mailing list as well as the Twitter on Twitter um, closer to the event, but it'll pretty much be uh, an event online where we'll have at least one board director available um, throughout all time zones for 24 hours to help answer community questions specifically um, pertaining to what it takes to be a board member, the elections, um, any, any questions a community may have. Uh, we also have a very active uh, Twitter account, so please follow us there. And as Marlene and Lorena have mentioned, we have a blog that is also very active. And recently we started doing a newsletter, which now goes out every two months where we consolidate um, all the community information, um, especially PSF information. So please do subscribe. Thank you both for taking the time to have this chat with us today. And hopefully um, we've shared helpful, helpful tips to everyone interested.